Peace TV, the solution for humanity. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuhu. Brothers and sisters, it is indeed a fantastic opportunity to see such a lovely gathering at this mega event, Peace for Humanity. When this whole concept was conceived, it was only a dream, which has now been realized thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The response is phenomenal. Imagine such a big Muslim festival for 10 days. How often do we get an opportunity like this to gather all Muslim and non-Muslim brothers and sisters under one roof? Indeed, we are fortunate and we should be thankful to Allah for giving us such an opportunity. In today's world scenario, we feel that there is a need for promoting better ideals amongst the youth whether one is a follower of Islam or any other religion. It is essential to know the ultimate power on earth. As I belong to the religion of Islam, I thought this is my duty to bring the youth of today to know not only the ideals of the religion, but also the need to live with communal harmony for the good of the world as a whole. In order to know about the religion for communal harmony, one is to be educated to the utmost. This event is purely for communal harmony, is for awareness, and it is for education. I request Brother Ashraf to give the bayadita of Brother Zakir Naik before he starts his lecture. Shukran. Dr. Zakir Naik is a medical doctor by professional training but he's an internationally acclaimed orator on Islam and comparative religion. He clarifies and clears misconceptions about Islam using Quran, authentic Hadith, and other religious scriptures, which he quotes verbatim in conjunction with reason, logic, and scientific facts. He's popular for his critical analysis and convincing answers to challenging questions posed by audiences worldwide after his public talks. He has delivered public talks in the USA, Canada, UK, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Australia, South Africa, Botswana, Malaysia, Singapore, Hong Kong, Thailand, Guyana, South America, and many other countries in addition to numerous other talks in India. Sheikh Ahmed Didat, the world famous orator on Islam and comparative religion, has called Dr. Zakir Naik Didat Plus. Dr. Zakir Naik appears regularly on many international TV channels in more than 150 countries of the world. More than 100 of his talks, dialogues, debates, and symposia are available on DVDs. He has authored several books on Islam and comparative religion. I present before you, brothers and sisters, Dr. Zakir Nayak will speak on the topic, The Purpose of Creation. Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalam, ala rasulillah, wa ala ali asabi ajmain, amma abad. A'uzu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim, bismillahi rahman rahim Wa ma khalaqtu al-jinna wal insa illa li abdun. Rabbi shuhali sadri, wa yassir li amri, wa halul ugdata min lisani yafkahu kawli. The respected people on the rest, my respected elders, and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you. With the Islamic greetings, Assalamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullahi wa Barakatuhu. May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, of Almighty God, be on all of you. The topic 
of this evening's talk is the purpose of creation. This question, what is the purpose of creation, arises in the mind of every individual, sometime or the other, irrespective whether he's rich or poor, king or pauper, black or white, yellow or brown, whether he lives in America or UK, whether he lives in India or Saudi Arabia. This question, sometime or the other, crops up in the mind of each and every individual. Why have we been created? Why are we here? What is our purpose in this world? And most of the human beings, they think that there has to be a supreme creator, that is Almighty God, and because of him, we are here. However, there is a minority who do not believe in the existence of the creator, of Almighty God, and they assume that the full world has come into existence by chance. And we human beings too, we have come into being by chance. Suppose you see on the beach the footprints of a human being. Immediately, a logical person, he thinks that these footprints have been created by the walking of a person. A logical person will not assume that the footprints came into existence by chance or the footprints came into existence by the waves coming on the beach and when the waves went away, it created these footprints. A logical person will realize that these footprints have been created by a person. It had a purpose why it was created. This question, what is the purpose of creation, can be answered in two perspectives. Number one, from the perspective of the creator, that is Almighty God. And second, by the perspective of the creation, that is human being. The first perspective is the view of the creator Almighty God. What caused him to create the human being? What caused him to create this creation? And number two, from the perspective of the creation, that the human beings, that why were we created by Almighty God? Those people who do not agree in the existence of Almighty God and believe that we have come in this world by mere chance, according to this philosophy, there is no difference between the human beings and all the other creation. All have come by chance, even the human beings as well as the animals. So these people do not have a particular purpose in life at all. They don't have a purpose for existence. And they live the same way as the animals. Drink, sleep, rest, and procreate. That's it. So the purpose of the animals and the human beings become the same. To eat, to drink, to rest, to sleep, and to procreate. And because they don't have a purpose, they try and strive excellence in eating, in drinking, in living, and they become materialistic. And that's the reason for such people, materialism becomes their god. And because of this, the same people, they create drugs just to earn money, to have a better living. They create bombs and weapons of mass destruction. They involve in fornication, in adultery, in homosexuality, in pornography. It doesn't make a difference to them whether they make drugs or whether they involve themselves in pornography. Their main purpose is just nothing but materialism. Let us discuss today the answer to this question, what is the purpose of creation from both point of view? First, we'll discuss from the creator's point of view, from the point of view of Almighty God, from the point of view of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What caused him to create the human beings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Ghafir, chapter number 40, verse number 57, that the creation of the heavens and the earth are far greater than the creation of the human beings. But most of the human beings here, they realize it not. 
Many women may feel that we are the greatest of the creation. But Allah says that the creation of the heavens and the earth is far greater than the creation of the human beings. And in reply to this query, that why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why Almighty God created us? One of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, is the creator, the best creator. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 14, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Almighty God, is the best to create. If there is a creator, if his attribute is creator, there has to be a creation. If there's no creation, then there cannot be a creator. For example, if you call a person as the best writer, but naturally you'll ask him that where is the material you have written? Where is the book you have written? Where is the article you have written? So when he presents the article or the book, then we can say, fine, he is the best writer. Similarly, since one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, the best creator, he has to have a creation. But that does not mean that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is dependent on his creation. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Zumur, chapter number 39, verse number 62, that it is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who creates everything and he is independent of all his creation. He is not dependent on these things, but the creations are dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Arabic word for create is khalik, and to create, the Arabic word is khalaka. Khalaka can be divided into two types. One meaning of khalaq is to create something from something, which besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even we human beings and other creation can do. For example, a carpenter who creates a chair and a table with the help of wood and nails. But the wood has been obtained from the trees, which has not been created by the carpenter, not by human beings, but by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The nails have been obtained from metal, which have been obtained from rock, which again is a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So all the creations done by human beings, they're dependent on basic elements, all of which have been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this type of creation, to create something from something, is a limited type of creation. The ultimate and the true creation is to create something from nothing. And this, no one besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can do. To create something from nothing. This is the ultimate creation, which none of the creation can do except the uncreated Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is the creator of all the creation. Since his attribute is the creator, there has to be creation. There are various attributes given in the Quran. For example, he's called as Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Ar-Ghafir, the merciful, the kind, the forgiver. The creation of the human beings is a unique creation. We human beings, we have a free will of our own. We can either obey our Creator Almighty God or we can disobey. It is a unique creation. And because we have this ability to either obey or disobey our Creator, we can even sin. We can sin. And only because the human beings can sin can the quality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as being the forgiver, being kind, being merciful, can be known. If human beings, if we did not have a free will, and if we had followed everything what Allah has commanded, there would be no difference between us and the angels. The angels are a creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who do not have a free will of their own. They obey each and every commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because they don't have a free will of their own. But the human beings have a free will. And because of this free will, the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the kindness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can be known. The other attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that is given in the Quran is loving. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in several places in the Quran that he loves those people who trust in him, those people who are patient, those who are righteous, those who are pious, those who are patient and perseverance, those who approach him and those who trust in him. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, 
chapter number 3, verse number 31, he tells to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he tells him, that tell, that if you love Allah, follow me, and Allah will love you and forgive your sins. The Prophet has been commanded by the Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to tell the people that if you love Allah, you have to follow me, that is follow the Prophet. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you and he will forgive your sins. And there's a hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned in Tirmidhi and has been authenticated as Sahih by Sheikh Nasrin Dalmani and in Sahih Tirmidhi, hadith number 3540, where our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa he says that if you ask Allah, Allah says, if you approach to me, I will answer you. And if you ask for forgiveness, I will forgive you. Even if your sins reach up to the cloud, I will forgive you. Even if your sins are as big as the complete earth, I will approach you in the same way with forgiveness as long as you ask for forgiveness and do not associate partners with me. That means whatever sin you do, as long as you ask for forgiveness with sincere repentance, if you do not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, don't do shirk, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will forgive you. One of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the grace. And the beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number four, hadith number 6765, where the Prophet said that do the right things, do the best deeds to the best of your ability and be happy. Do the right things to the best of your ability and be happy. For no one can enter Jannah only on the basis of his deeds. So one of the sahabas asked that, what about you, Rasulullah? So the Prophet said, not even I. I cannot enter Jannah unless with the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his grace. Unless his grace and mercy and his forgiveness envelop me, I cannot enter Jannah. So here we realize that without the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no one can enter Jannah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse 160, Allah says that if you do any good deeds, I will multiply it 10 times into your account. And if you do any evil deed, I will only count it as once. For Allah, he does not do anything wrong. So here we realize that if any good deed you do, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, he will multiply it minimum 10 times into your account. If you do any evil deed, he'll count as one. That means if everyone was accounted one point for his good deed and one point for his evil deed, without multiplication of the good deeds, not a single human being would have entered Jannah. It is the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he multiplies your good deeds and gives you multiple times more reward that you shall go to Jannah. That does not mean that deeds aren't important. Deeds are very important. But the grace is more important. Without the grace of Allah, you cannot enter Jannah. Allah multiplies, but your deeds also should be there. If your deeds are there, don't even multiply. If your deeds are zero, and if you multiply it even a million times, it will be useless. So deeds are also important, but without the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, no human being can enter paradise. So because of his quality attribute of being merciful, kind, forgiving, loving, and grace, all these are manifested in the Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the attributes is also supreme justice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has ilm gab. Before a person is born, he knows that after a person is born, whether he'll do good deeds or bad deeds, whether he'll listen to the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or will he disobey, he knows. He even knows whether the person will go to Jahannam or Jannah, whether he'll go to hell or paradise, he knows. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the moment a person is born, or before he's born, he puts him in heaven, person who deserves heaven, and puts the person in hell who deserves hell, the people who have been put in heaven, they may not object. They may say, fine, alhamdulillah, we have been put into heaven, no problem. But surely those people who have been put in hell, they will object that how come you haven't let us lead our life, and without a test, you have put us in hell? So because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. 
That's the reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lets the people live in this world. And if you follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you pass the test, otherwise you fail the test. And people may ask that one of the pillars of Iman, the last pillar, is Qadr, is destiny. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Sajda, chapter number 32, verse number 12, Allah says, all these people who will go to hell, on the day of judgment, they will never object to the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They will say, all these sinners, they will bow their head down and say, please forgive us. They will agree with the Lord. They will say, please give us one more chance so that we can go again in the world. And that time we will surely be believers. But Allah knows that even if he forgives them and puts them back into this world, but natural, he'll have to wash out their memory of what they've seen of the hell. Allah is sure that they'll again commit the same mistake. And this is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Anam, chapter number six, verse number 28, that if these people were again sent in the world, they would repeat the same mistakes because they are liars. So Allah knows in his divine wisdom that these people, even if he sends them again, if the memory is washed out or what they've seen of the hell, they will do the same mistakes. But coming to the question of Qadr, Qadr is the sixth pillar of Iman, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we Muslims believe that Allah writes the Qadr, he writes the destiny. And people may object, many people ask this question, Muslim and non muslims alike, that if everything Allah has written in the destiny, that fine whether this person is going to do good or bad, whether they're going to commit a murder, or whether they're going to commit a rape, or whether they're going to rob, or whether they're going to do good deeds, whether they're going to go to hell or heaven. If everything is mentioned, then where is our choice? Who's to blame? If I commit a murder, Allah wrote in the Qadr, I'm going to commit a murder, and I commit a murder. Who's to blame? Allah is to blame. So why should I be put in hell? And this is a very logical question. The reply to this question is that we have to understand the concept of Qadr and destiny. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has destined things where a person is going to be born, in which condition he'll be born, when will he die, which land will he die. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse number 14 that whenever a child is born, the father is bound on his neck. The moment he's born, Allah knows everything what he's going to do, good or bad, right or wrong, whether he's going to go to hell or heaven. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ilm gab I'll give you an example. There's suppose in a class, there's a teacher who teaches about 100 students for about one year. And before the examination, that teacher predicts that this student, he will come out first in class, first class first. This student, he'll get second class. That student will fail. Just an example, don't feel bad, brother. Now, after a few days, the examination takes place, and this student comes out first class first, this student gets second class, and that student fails. Now, I'm asking you a question. Can the student who failed, can you object to the teacher that because you predicted I'm going to fail, I have failed? Who's to blame, the teacher or the student? Who's to blame? The student. The teacher predicted this student, he plays hooky, he doesn't attend class, he sees movie, therefore he's going to fail. That student is okay, average. That student is very intelligent, does good, hard work. So teacher predicts in advance before the examination, this student will get a first class first, this student second class, that student will fail, and the student comes out first class first, second class, that student fails. But because the teacher predicted, that does not mean the teacher is to blame. The teacher has taught everyone correctly and equally. Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has ilm gab he has knowledge of the future. Certain things they are destined. He has said that okay, this person will be born in this land on this particular date. He'll die in this land in this particular date, etc. His surrounding, he'll be wealthy or whatever it is. But the choice is yours. For example, after you pass your 12th standard, you have a choice of becoming an engineer or becoming a doctor or becoming a lawyer. The choice is yours. You choose to become an engineer. So Allah already knows in advance that after you pass your standard 12, you will choose to become an engineer. He's written in advance. It is not because Allah has written that you're choosing. It is because you have chosen, Allah has written in advance. 
The choice is yours. But Allah knows your choice. For example, if you come at a crossroad, and there are five roads, road number one, two, three, four, five, the choice is yours. You can either take road number one, two, three, four, five. You choose road two. It's already mentioned in advance in your destiny that you will choose road two. It is not because Allah is writing that you're choosing. It is because you will be choosing that Allah has written in advance. So the choice is yours. You have a choice to earn your living, whether with good deeds, halal way, or with robbing, haram ways. The choice is yours. Now you rob. The choice was yours. But Allah knows in advance that this person, he would want easy money and he will rob. So Allah has written in advance that this particular person at the age of 25, he will rob. Who's to blame? You are to blame. But because Allah has written a gap, he has written in advance. The choice is yours. Allah has given us human beings free will. You cannot blame Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for your misdeeds. If you go to hell, it is because of your misdeeds. And if you go to Jannah, it is because of the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let's try and answer this question. The purpose of creation from a different angle, from the angle of the creation, from the angle, from the perspective of the human being. That why have the human beings been created by Almighty God? And the reply to this question is given in the Quran, in Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 172 and verse number 173. Allah says that he brought out from the loins of Adam's children, may peace be upon him, all the descendants, and asked them that, am I your Lord? And all said, we testify that you are our Lord. And Allah continues, lest on the day of judgment, they will say, we were unaware that you are our Lord. Or lest they may say that our ancestors, they worship somebody else, they did shirk, they associated partners, and we just followed them. So they are the liars. We should not be blamed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before the human beings came in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought all the human beings from the loins of the children of Adam and asked them, who is the Lord? And all of them testified that there's one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he's our Lord. And now is our test in this world. Allah says in the Quran, and I started my talk by quoting the verse of the Quran from Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51. Verse number 56, Allah says that we have created the jinn and the men, not but to worship me. That we have created the jinn and the men, not but to worship me. The purpose of creation of the human beings and the jinn is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now this word worship, if you analyze this English word, it is derived from the old English, Vyot Skype, which means to honor. And if you read the new living Webster's Encyclopedia Dictionary, it says that worship means act of devotion, honoring the deity. Devotional acts, honoring the deity. And if you translate into Arabic, the Arabic word is ibadah. The Arabic word for worship is ibadah. It is derived from the root word abd, which means a slave. And it is the duty of the slave to be obedient to all the wills and wishes of the master. So ibadah means total submission to the will of the creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ibadah means total submission to the will and wishes of the creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And further, if we analyze that, even one of the forms of worship, as mentioned in the English dictionary, is glorification. As Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An Nasr, chapter 110, verse number 3, Allah says, Iza ja Nasrullah wal Fat, Waraitan Nas, Yet Kuluna, Feedin Life Faja, Fasabbi Bihamdi Rabbi Kawas Takfir, in Nau Kanata Waba. That means, Glorify the praises of the Lord. Glorify the praises of the Lord. So one form of worship is glorification of the creator of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one may ask that why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala require the human beings to glorify him? Is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala dependent on the praises of the human beings? See, irrespective 
if all the human beings praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it will not make him superior. And if not a single human being praise him, yet it will not diminish him. He is the same. Whether you say Allah Akbar a thousand times or a million times, it will not make Allah greater. Or if you don't say Allah Akbar also, it will not make him less. He is the greatest, he'll remain the greatest. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse 15, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't require the human beings. It is we who require him, it is the human beings who require him, and he is worthy of all praises. The Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not require his creation. It is the creation who require Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he is worthy of all praises. So the question is, why does he require us to praise him? The reason is, it is for our own benefit. Because it is a human tendency that if we praise a person, if a person is famous, we tend to follow his advice. For example, if your mother is suffering from a heart problem, and there are two options. The one option who you have is the best doctor in the world. Number one, very famous, everyone knows him. Number one, other person is just a plain MBBS doctor. And you have the option of going to any of them. Both are giving free treatment. Who will you go to? But naturally, you go to the one who's very famous, number one in the world, the heart specialist. And whatever advice he gives you, because he's world famous and you even acknowledge him to be the greatest amongst all the doctors, you will follow his advice. That is the reason when we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and call him, he's the greatest, he's the most merciful, he's the most kind. The moment we praise him, whatever advice he has given us in the last and final revelation of the glorious Quran, or whatever advice he has given us through his messengers, and the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we will follow it. So the reason we praise him is not for the benefit of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. He does not require praises. It is for our own benefit. The moment we praise him, oh, he's the greatest. He's the most wise. Oh, he's telling you not to have alcohol. Then you stop having alcohol. The moment you agree that he's the most wise, he's the greatest, he's the most merciful, immediately whatever advice he gives you, it is human tendency, we follow the advice of the person who's the greatest. So that's the reason we praise him for our own benefit. And that's the reason Allah SWT says in the Quran, in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 14, that verily, I am Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I am Allah, and there is no God besides me. So remember me regularly, and offer prayer regularly. Allah is guiding, that offer prayer regularly. Because today in the world there are so many evils, so many distractions, we tend to deviate. This salah is a sort of programming towards righteousness. This form of worship is a programming towards righteousness. We are getting programmed. As the doctor says that for a healthy body, you require minimum three meals a day. So for a pure soul, for a healthy soul, you require minimum five times salah. So all forms of worship are benefit for us. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 183, that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to those who came before you so that you may learn self-restraint. Why do we fast? So that we learn self-restraint. And today, the psychologists tell us that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. So when we fast, we abstain from food, drink, from dawn to sunset. If we can control our hunger, we can control almost all your desires. So by fasting, we are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But who's benefiting? Not Allah. We are benefiting. We are learning to control our desires. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90. Ya ayu al amnu. O you who believe, inna mal khamru wal maisuru. Most certainly intoxicants and gambling. Wal anzabu al azamu. Dedication of stones, divination of arrows. Rich summan amili shaitan. These are Satan's handiwork. First to flihun. Abstain from this handiwork that you may prosper. Here we are being guided by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That, oh you believe, most certainly intoxicants. Gambling. Dedication of stones, that's idol worship. Divination of arrows, that is fortune telling. These are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from it that you may prosper. And Allah says in the next verse, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 91, that Satan, he creates enmity and hatred between the human beings through intoxicants and gambling. And this takes you away from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah is guiding you. When you offer salah or when you read the Quran, that's a form of worship. 
when of a salah form of worship, you are getting guided. Let's stay away from intoxicants, from gambling. It is the Satan who uses this to create enmity between the human beings. And this will take you away from remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All forms of worship, any act, any commandment that you follow of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a form of worship. Any commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala a human being follows, it's a form of worship. As long as you do it in the right way. There are two things, there are two criteria required. Number one is that you should do it only for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not for your own glorification or praising your own self. Any act you do, you should do it for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever Allah commands you, do it for His pleasure, not for glorification, not for praise, not for becoming famous. Criteria number one. Criteria number two, that it should be done the way Allah and His Messenger have commanded you. Whatever Allah has asked you, do it the way Allah has asked you to do or the way His Messenger has asked you to do. If you do it in any other way, that's not called worship. So do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, follow His commandments and the commandment of the Prophet. But the way Allah and His Prophet have told you, if you do it any other way, then it is not correct. And it's mentioned in the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad in Sahih Muslim, volume number two, hadith number 1885, where the Prophet Muhammad said that the worst of all the affairs is innovation in the religion, innovation in deen. It is a curse. And the innovation in the deen will take you to hellfire. I Means the worst of all the affairs is bidah in deen, innovation in deen. And this is a curse and will take you towards hellfire. So whatever you do, worship, there's a general rule that all types of worship is prohibited except the type which is mentioned in the Quran and the Sai Hadith. The type which has been mentioned by Allah and His Rasul. Any other type of worship is prohibited. It is forbidden, except that type of worship which has been described in the Quran and described in the Sahih Hadith of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So further if we analyze that the purpose of the creation of the human being is to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And when we worship Him, we benefit. It helps us. And there's a misconception that Islam is a new religion which came into existence 1400 years ago. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the founder of this religion of Islam. In fact, Islam is there since time immemorial, since man set foot on this earth. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is not the founder of this religion. He is the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There were several messengers that came, as Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fatir, chapter 35, verse 24, there is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner or a guide. Allah says in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 7, And to every people has a warner been sent. There are more than 25 messengers mentioned by name in the Quran. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. All of them were messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all of them they were Muslims. Muslim is a person who submits his will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Islam is a word which comes from the root word salam, which means peace, or from salima, or silm, which means to submit your will to Almighty God. So Islam, in short, means peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Almighty God, the Creator. All the messengers, they brought the same message. And anyone who submits his will, to the Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is called as a Muslim. Quran says in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 52, that Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was a Muslim. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 67, that Abraham was not a Jew or a Christian, but he was a Muslim. And since our Creator is one, humankind is one, even the religion should be one. That is the reason Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, Inna dina in the Lail Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is Islam, which is peace acquired by submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah repeats the message in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 85, 
that if anyone desires any other religion besides Islam, it will never be accepted of him. And in the Akhirah, he will be among the losers. Since our Creator is one, humankind is one, the religion is also one, and all the prophets teach the same message of submitting your will to Almighty God, worshipping him alone and no one else. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Bayyana, chapter number 98, verse number 7, that those who have faith and do righteous deeds, they are the best of creation. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls the human beings the best of creation. The greatest, there are many greater creation like the heaven, the earth, but the best of creation is the human being because we have a free will. And if with that free will, we obey the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we reach the best of creation, highest. We are better even than the angels because angels don't have a free will. Human beings have a free will and then if you obey the commandment, we become superior to the angels. But if you don't obey his commandments, we become the brothers of the Satan. So the human beings are the best creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the gravest sin that is described in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive any sin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he pleases, he will forgive any sin. But the sin of shirk, he'll never forgive. Allah repeats the message in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he pleases, he will forgive any sin. But the sin of associating partners with him, he shall never forgive. The greatest sin for the human being is associating partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, worshipping anyone besides the one true God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is love. And as I mentioned, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he loves his creation. And because he loves us with his grace, he has given us all this niyama. All the niyama that is given us, the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, all the facilities that Allah has given us because he loves us. And those who obey his commandments, he has prepared a place for us in paradise, in the next life also. This is because of his love. The beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Muslim, volume number one, hadith number 67, that that person has tasted the sweetness of the faith. Those who do three things. Number one, those who love. Those who love Allah and his messenger more than everyone in the world. Number two, those who love human beings or those who love people for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And number three, those who hate to go back to disbelief from where Allah saved them and they don't want to go to the hellfire. So these people who do these three things, according to the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they have tasted the true sweetness of faith. And as Allah mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 31, the Prophet has commanded to say that all those who love Allah, follow me, for Allah will love you and Allah will forgive you. Now if we analyze that we human beings, we too love the other human beings, we love our parents, our father and mother, we love our wives, we love our children. And the reason we love them basically is because these people, these human beings, have done certain favor on us. For example, we love our mother because she bore us in a womb for nine months. She took care of us in childhood. She brought us up. We love our brothers. Either they have given us something or we want something from them. We love the human beings. So in that context, if we calculate the favors Allah has done on us, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 34, that if you count the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will not be able to add them up. So imagine if we love our parents for the few things they have given us, how much should we love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the love differs. We human beings, we will love animals. We love human beings also. But the love of the animals that the human beings have is different on a different level as compared to the love that we have for the human beings. Similarly, the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
is on a different level as compared to the love we have for the human beings. It is far superior. It is far more on a higher plateau. It is mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Fatiha, chapter number one, verse number five. Iyya kana abdu wa yaa kana stain. Thee alone we worship. Thee alone we ask for help. We have to only worship Him and no one else. Allah says in Surah Ghafir, chapter number forty, verse number sixty. You ask me, and I will answer your prayer. Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number one eighty-six. O Messenger, when they ask you about me, tell them I am near to them. And I will answer their prayers. So all worship should only be done to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and no one else. He is the only one who deserves the worship and no one else. Now let us analyze the purpose of creation from another perspective, from the perspective of the human beings. That what is the purpose of existence in this world? God created us. We came in this world. What is our requirement? What is our purpose of existence? And Allah gives the reply in Surah Mulk, chapter number sixty-seven, verse number two. Allah says, "Allah zee khalaq al maut wal hayata." It's Allah who has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. Allah has created death and life to test which of you is good in deeds. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number three, verse number one eighty-five. Allah says, "Kullu nafsin zaykatul maut." Every soul shall have a taste of death, but the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. And anyone who has been saved from the fire and enters the garden, he would have achieved the objective of this world. For this world is nothing but mere chattels of deception. That means this life of ours in this world is a test for the hereafter. If we obey the commandments of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, in the next life we will get paradise. If we don't obey, we will not get paradise. We will go to hell. So this life, the purpose of existence, as Allah says, is the test for the hereafter. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number twenty-nine, verse number two, that do you think, just by saying we believe, we will let you go? We will surely test you. I Means if you just say, I believe in Allah, I am a Muslim, I am a Muslim, do you think Allah will let you go? Finish your test is over. Allah says, "Don't you think we will test you? Just by saying I am a Muslim, just by saying you are a believer, just by saying I submit my will to Almighty God, you will not go scot-free. Allah will surely test you." And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number one hundred and fifty-five, that surely we will test you with fear and hunger, with loss of your lives and of the goods and what you have accumulated in your life. And give glad tidings to those who are patient. Allah says He'll test everyone, either with fear or with hunger, or with loss of life, or with goods, or the wealth they've accumulated. Allah will test you. And Allah tests different people in different ways. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An-Nam, chapter number six, verse number one hundred and sixty-five, Allah says that He has given more sustenance to some of the human beings over the other. With some of the human beings, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has given more sustenance as compared to the other. Allah says this in Surah Nahl, chapter number sixteen, verse number seventy-one, that He has favored some of the human beings over others in sustenance. Allah repeats this message in Surah Anam, chapter number six, verse number one hundred and sixty-five, that Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala has given more gifts to some of the individuals, and based on what He has given you, He will test you. Now there's a question that people ask: that how can Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala be just? That some people are born in a poor family, some people are born in a rich family, some people are born healthy, some people are born with diseases. It is unjust. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala is unjust. How can He make the differentiation between different human beings? We come to know that this world has life and death. There is health and disease. There is wealth and poverty. All these are tests. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Anfal, chapter number eight, verse number twenty-eight, Allah says that surely your wealth and your progeny, your children, are a test for you. And Allah says in chapter number sixty-three, verse number nine, 
that let not the wealth and your children deviate you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests different people in different way. One of the tests, one of the best deeds you ask anyone, that what are the good deeds? And the good deeds that all human beings, whether they believe in God or not, they'll say, the good deeds are charity, it is contentment, charity will be there amongst the few that he names. So how can Almighty God test whether some people are charitable or not? If all the people have the same wealth, then where is the question of the test? The test will only take place if some people are poor and some people are rich. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tests people in different ways. Maybe some people are born in a rich family, they have a lot of wealth. Some people are born poor. But the person who is rich, according to the Islamic Sharia, one of the pillars of Islam is zakat. That's every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he or she should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. The person may be a millionaire, may be a billionaire. He may give the required amount, then he will get passing marks. He may not give the complete amount, he may give portion, small portion, maybe 20% of what is required to give, a part of what is required to give. He will fail. Some people may not give zakat at all. Absolutely fail. The poor person, he does not have to give zakat at all. He gets full marks. But we human beings, we say, oh, bichara admi, poor man. You know, so much problems he has in his life. And we look up to the person who's rich. Our beloved prophet said that it is more difficult for a rich man to enter Jannah than a poor man. For as the Quran says, in Surah Anfal, chapter 8, verse 28, that the wealth is a test for you. It's a test. We are fools that we think, okay, you know, ah, this person is rich. Allah has blessed him. It's a test. If he doesn't use the blessing which Allah has given him, it's a blessing. But the chances of him failing the test is very high. For example, in one of the question papers, which came last year, or two years before, in 2002, a very difficult question came. And most of the students could not reply. Next year, that question does not appear. It would be foolish for us to say, oh, how sad this question did not come. You should be happy. It did not come. So wealth is a test. So those people who don't have wealth, it is actually easier for them to go to Jannah than a rich man. So Allah tests different people in different ways. Therefore, Allah says that let not your wealth deviate you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a test for him. The other test, it is contentment. It's contentment. And a beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number 8, hadith number 447. The Prophet said, that even if a person owns a valley of gold, he would want to have another. Even if a person owns a valley of gold, he would want to own another valley of gold. And the maximum he can take in his mouth is the dirt of the grave. However rich he is, let him be the richest man in the world. The person would want to crave for more wealth. A person is not content. Most of the human beings aren't content. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 32, that do not ask from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that which Allah has favored other people. We say, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have given him so much wealth, you have given him such a good, beautiful car. Don't ask from Allah what Allah has favored others with. It will be lost for you. And our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number four. Our beloved Prophet said that, look at those people who are less fortunate than you. Don't look at those people who are more fortunate than you, lest it will divert you from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lest you may be ungrateful to your Lord. So Prophet said, look at those who are less fortunate. Then you say, okay, fine. The person, you know, he doesn't have a car. At least I have a small car, Maruti car. Don't look at a person having a Mercedes. Oh, why don't I have a Mercedes? The person doesn't have a car. At least Allah has given me a car. You'll be thankful to Allah. The moment you compare yourself with the person who has a Mercedes, oh, why hasn't Allah given me a Mercedes? So look at those people who are less fortunate. It will help you to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is human nature. And there's a saying, that there was a man who complained because he had no shoes until he saw a man who had no feet. 
A person used to complain, I've got no shoes. Complain to Allah, I've got no shoes. And he saw a man who had no feet. Then he's thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least I have feet. So contentment is a test. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number eight, that the real wealth is contentment. It is not property. The real true wealth is contentment, being satisfied. Whatever you have, you say, Alhamdulillah. Praise be to Allah. That is the true woman. That's a true believer. That's a true Muslim. Contentment. While people ask, that how come Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created some people who are born healthy? He makes some people born healthy. Some people are born with diseases. Maybe congenital disease, heart disease. Some are born handicapped. So is Allah unjust? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 40, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is never unjust in the least degree. This is a test. Allah tests different people in different ways. Maybe it's possible the children that are born, they are masoom, they are sinless. It's not their fault at all. But as the Quran says in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8, verse number 28, that your wealth and your children are a test for you. And Allah repeats the message in chapter 63, verse number 9. That do not let your wealth and your children deviate from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So maybe possible that it's a test for the parents. It's a test for the parents. There may be occasion whenever any calamity comes on any individual, it is either a test or it's a punishment. Those people who have deviated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for them it's a punishment. From those who are on the true path, it's a test for them. Maybe the parents are very good Muslims, offering five times Salah, may I have given the zakat, may I have gone for hajj, maybe fasting the month of Ramadan. Now Allah gives them a child who has congenital heart disease. The true Muslim, a true moment will say, Alhamdulillah, thank you Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is testing them. A person who is ungrateful or may not be able to pass the difficult test, we say, oh, why? He will start cribbing. He'll complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why did Allah give me a child who's handicapped, who has congenital heart disease? And more difficult the test, more high is the reward. More difficult is the test, more high is the reward. For example, if you sit for a BA degree examination, if you pass, you're a graduate, BA graduate in arts. But if you pass an MBBS examination, besides being a graduate, you get a doctor in front of your name, doctor. But to pass an MBBS examination is multiple times more difficult than to pass a B examination. So more difficult the test, more high is the reward. So maybe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to give those parents, not Jannah, but jannat firdos So even though they're pious, Allah wants to give them a higher reward. And that is the reason our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa said, it's mentioned in Sunnah Tirmidhi, when a person asked that who had the maximum test in this world, the Prophet replied that all the Ambiyas, all the Prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they had the most difficult test. After that, those who were closest to them, those who were like the Prophets. After that, those who were like them. And more higher is the faith of a person, more difficult is the test. The more taqwa a person has, Allah gives you a difficult test. See, you took admission into MBBS because you got high marks in 12th standard. High? So more difficult test. To pass MBBS is difficult. So here also, the prophets, their taqwa level cannot be compared with the normal human beings. So just because they were prophets of God, even the prophets were tested. No prophet was just led without testing. But because the taqwa was high, the prophets were tested multiple times more than the normal human being like, compared to you and me. More difficult. So more higher, is your taqwa and the faith, Allah will test you. So true believer, if difficulty comes, he says, ah, subhanallah, praise be to Allah, alhamdulillah. He takes it as a test. Any calamity comes, it's either a test or a punishment. For the prophets of high taqwa, it wasn't a punishment, it was a test. And they passed the test. When any good things happen to an individual, it's either a reward or a test. Wealth can be a reward, or it can be a test for you. Any good thing happens, it is either a reward or a test for you. For those who have deviated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they pray, give me wealth, Allah gives them wealth, and tells them and they fail. So in this world, they get what they want, luxury, 
But in the Akhira, it's nothing but loss. Charity is a test. Contentment is a test. Your children are a test. Many a time, we human beings, we complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why doesn't Allah answer our prayer? Allah says in the Quran, you ask me and I will answer your prayer. But here I'm praying every day, Allah is not answering. It sounds a bit contradictory. Allah says, you pray to me and I answer your prayer. But we find many a time, we pray but nothing happens. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 216, you may like a thing which is not good for you. And you may hate a thing which is good for you. You know not, but Allah knows. For example, there is a young boy, about 20 years old. He's praying, Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, give me a BMW. I don't know if they're aware of BMW. BMW motorcycle. I want a BMW motorcycle. Very fast motorcycle. Praying. Praying, praying. Prayer is not answered. Maybe Allah knows that if Allah would have given him a motorcycle, he would have had an accident and he would have fractured his leg. He would have become handicapped. So, actually Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by not answering his prayer, he's answering his prayer. By not answering his prayer, Allah is answering his prayer. By not giving him a motorcycle because he's a good banda, he's a good person. He's asking for things which is not good for him. I know, he doesn't know. So Allah doesn't give. So by not answering, Allah is answering. And many a time people, like Allah says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 15 and 16, about the hypocrites, he says that Allah gives them rope so that they go to and fro. You ask wealth, Allah gives them wealth. There are many people who associate partners with Allah. They ask, I want wealth, Allah gives them wealth. It is nothing but a test for them, and they are digging their own graves. So we should never despair. Allah is there. Always have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the reason suicide is haram in the Quran. It's mentioned in Surah Nisa chapter 4. That kill not yourself. Kill not yourself, because Allah is most forgiving. He is there. If you have faith in him, the moment a person commits suicide, it is as though he's ungrateful. He says, Almighty God has given me so much trouble. He is unjust. It's not worth living and ends his life. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 286, which is the last verse of Surah Baqarah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not lay a burden on anyone greater than what he can bear. Allah does not lay a burden on anyone greater than what he can bear. This is the first part of the verse. The next part of the verse continues, and then we make a dua. Ya Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, lay not on us a burden greater than we can bear. In the first part of the verse, when Allah has already promised that he will not lay a burden greater than what we can bear, then why do we have to pray, O oh Lord, lay not on us a burden greater than we can bear? Because why? We dig our own grave. We lay a burden greater than what we can bear. We are the cause. We ask, give me wealth, Allah gives wealth. <laughs> so we are praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make not us the cause to lay a burden on ourselves greater than we can bear. So we should always have faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And worship him alone. He is the creator. Our purpose of existence is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And no one else. This life is a test for the hereafter. Obey his commandments and be satisfied. Whatever test he gives you, a true moment is thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Normally we complain, we don't have this, we don't have this. The most important thing for living is what? Someone tells food. Someone say water. Most important is air. If you don't have air, for a few minutes you will die. How many of us have we ever thanked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Thank you for the air you have given us. How many of us have done that? How many of us do we realize? Free. Free me milta to kya? We should reflect on the signs of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the niyama he has given us. Now come to the last perspective. So why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create this world? What is the purpose of this world? Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 32 and 33, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created the heavens and the earth and let water come from the sky. With it, he has given fruits. He has caused the ship to sail with the commandment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has called rivers to flow for the human beings. He has made the sun and the moon for you. He has made the night and the day for you. So all these creation in the world are for the human beings. The full world Allah has created is for the human beings. And it is our duty 
that we have to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for all these ni'amah. And besides thanking, it's our duty that we take care of these things. That's the reason. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created animals. But killing animals, it is prohibited. Killing animals is prohibited. It's mentioned hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa They do not kill animals for target practice. Yes, for food among the halal animal which Allah has given permission, that you can have. With the way Allah has showed you and the Prophet has showed us. But for target practice, and we find many people, they want to conquer these niyama. They do target practice and they want to put the head of the animal in the drawing room. Allah has created the mountains. We want to conquer the mountains, go on Mount Everest. How many people die every year in trying to climb the Mount Everest? We want to conquer it. We don't thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the niyama. Even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, the camels have been created for you to carry load. But even though they have been created for you, we have to love them, we have to respect them. There are several Sahih Hadith, several. It's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number three, that there's a person who gave water to a thirsty dog by going in the well, by carrying the water in the socks. And because of that, he was gone to Jannah. There's another hadith in Sahih Bukhari, volume number four, that there was a prostitute. Just because she gave water to a thirsty dog, she was gone to Jannah. And the Sahaba asked, that, do we get reward even for giving water to a dog? He said, yes, why not? Imagine the animal which is prohibited to come in our house. Even if we give water to that animal, Allah will reward you for that. And there's a hadith that once an old lady, she tied a cat and did not give it food. So Allah put her in hell, that why did she tie and did not give her food? At least you should have let it go free. She would have fed on the rodents. And that poster is there in one of the posters that is in the exhibition. So we have to even love and take care of the animals. Even the vegetations. We can eat them for a requirement, but not unnecessary. Kill the plants. Even in war, our Prophet Muhammad said that do not chop down trees, do not burn the crops. So all these are the creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Adiyat, chapter number 100, Allah says, Allah takes an oath of the steeds of war. The horses that run for war, Allah is taking oath and saying, Allah continues, verse number 1, 2, 3, 4, Allah says that these horses, sparks come out of their hooves, clouds of dust they raise, they enter the enemy, describing that Allah is taking an oath of these horses, the steeds of war. They are without any fear, just because their master commands them, the person who is a horse rider. For the sake of the master, they enter into the enemy. There are swords, there are weapons. Irrespective whether the weapons, the steed keeps on going because he wants to obey the master. Allah is taking oath of this horse. And in the ending he says, but man is ungrateful. That means the horse to obey the master it is ready to die. It is ready to get itself killed. Just because the master says go, it goes. Whether there's an enemy, whether there's a sword, whether there's a weapon, whether they're going towards the death, because of the master. But human beings are very ungrateful. That's the reason it's the duty of every human being to reflect on the purpose of creation. That why have we been created? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He's the creator. He's merciful, he's kind, he's forgiving, he's just. It's the duty of every human being that you should worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worship him and no one else. And this life, you have to remember, is a test for the hereafter. If we follow his commandments, we shall go to Jannah. If we don't, we shall fail this test and go to Jahannam. And we have to take care of the niyama Allah has given us. I'd like to end my talk by giving the quotation of the glorious Quran from Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 110, which says, Kuntum khaira ummatin ukhridat lin nas. O ye Muslims, ye are the best of people evolved for mankind. We are called as khaira ummah, the best of people. Whenever there is honor, it is always for the responsibility. There is no honor without responsibility. The responsibility is mentioned in the same verse, and Allah continues, ta'miruna bil ma'rufi wa tanhawna anil munkar. Because we enjoin what is good and we forbid what is wrong and we believe in Allah. It's the duty of every Muslim 
that whatever he knows, if you know the purpose of creation, you have to tell it to the others. By we created, we should worship no one but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This life is a test for the hereafter. Invite people to the truth, exhort them to the truth. Ta'miruna bil marufi watanhauna in munkar. And enjoin them towards the good and prevent them from going towards the wrong. It's the duty of every Muslim. Dawah is compulsory. If we do not enjoin what is good and we do not prevent people from going towards the wrong, we aren't fit to be called as Muslims. We aren't fit to be called as Khaira Ummah, the best of people. I would like to end my talk with the quotation of the Quran from Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse 125. He says, al hasna, hasan. Invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best most gracious. Now we move on to the question and answer session. Uh, before we begin, let me lay down the rules so that we can have the session in a very smooth fashion. Please form a queue at one of the four mics provided to you. One mic is in the ladies section. There are three mics in the gents section, one at the back side, one on my right, and one here on my left. While posing the questions, please state your name and profession. Please note that this is a question time, not a lecture time. So be precise and to the point when you pose your question. I request the volunteers who are handling the mic to give preference to our non-Muslim brothers who would be in the queue while posing the question. Please bring the non-Muslim brothers at the front. Preference is given to the non-Muslim brothers to pose the questions. Good evening, Dr. Zakir. My name is Roberto. I'm doing BDS in Chennai, Savita Dental College. As Dr. Zakir said, God is a unique creator. There is only one. Second thing, you said God created human by, out of love. Third, God has created wealth, poor, healthy, and weakness is all because of a test. Similarly, in Christian, they believe God is one. Second point, God created human out of love. Third point, it's the same thing. All this thing is because of a test by the God. So I just want to have an answer from you. Don't mistake, I'm not a Christian. The brother asked a question that even in Christianity, like Islam, God is one and God loves the creation. And he further said, then what is the difference? You want to know the difference between Islam and Christianity or? It's not the difference. What is the most convinced thing you think that you say that other than Islam, any other type of worship is non-acceptable? That's a very good question, the brother. Now the question has come to forth that first there were just blank statements. If there's a question mark, it's a question. If it's a statement, we have to try and find the question. What is the difference between Islamic form of worship as compared to other form of worship? What is so unique? When Christianity also says God is one, Christianity says that God also loves, Islam says God is one, Islam says God also loves the creation, Islam says worship, Christianity says worship. What is the difference between the worship of Islam and Christianity? Or what is the uniqueness about Islam as compared to other religions? Mainly talking about Christianity. Brother, on the face of it, if you read the Quran correctly and the interpretation I gave in my talk. And if you read the Bible correctly, that's the correct interpretation. We believe that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. But there are parting of faith. There are many Christians who say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. Now the difference between what the Bible says and the difference between what the Christians assume and what they practice, the difference between that. So many Christians say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he claimed divinity. So when they say God is one, they say Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God, which we Muslims take objection to. There is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself says that I am God or where he says worship me. 
So the form of worship for the normal Christian is worshiping Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And I repeat my statement. There is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon himself, says that I am God or where he says worship me. If any Christian can show me any unequivocal statement in the Bible where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says I am God or where he says worship me, I, Dr. Zakir Naik, I am ready to accept Christianity today. I am ready to put my head on the guillotine. I don't speak on behalf of my other Muslim brothers because if you read the Bible, it is mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 28. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that my father is greater than I. Gospel of John, chapter number 10, verse number 29, my father is greater than all. Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 12, verse number 28, I with the Spirit of God, cast out devil. Gospel of Luke, chapter number 11, verse number 20. I, with the finger of God, cast out devil. Gospel of John, chapter number 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. Therefore, I said in my talk that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a Muslim. Quran says that in Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 52. It's further mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3. This is life eternal so that you may know Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 14, verse number 24. The words you hear are not mine, but my Father's who has sent me. It's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. Ye men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles, which God did by him, and you are witness to it. A man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles, which God did by him, and you are witness to it. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was one of the mightiest messengers of God, but he never claimed divinity. He never said you should worship me. But unfortunately, the Christian church today, they teach that salvation. Bible also talks about heaven, talks about hell, but the purpose of existence is not mentioned in detail. It's not mentioned at all except what Paul has mentioned. Paul mentioned the Corinthians, chapter number 15. He says in the first Corinthians, chapter number 15, that if Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, died not for your sins, your faith is in vain, and everything is in vain. That means Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he died for your sins, according to Paul. And they quote the verse of the Bible, Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, that for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, whosoever believeth in him shall not die, but have everlasting life. So the concept of salvation, according to the church, is that you believe Jesus Christ, peace be upon died for your sins, and you shall go to Jannah, you shall go to paradise. Which is not mentioned because the word begotten from Gospel of John, chapter number 3, verse number 16, has been thrown out by Thaidu scholar of the highest eminence from the RSV, Revised Standard Version of the Bible, as a concoction, as a fabrication, as an interpolation. So what they're following is more of Pauline Christianity. But Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, when a person approaches him in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 and 17, that good master, what good things shall I do so that I shall gain eternal life? What good things shall I do so that I shall go to Jannah, paradise? So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, replies, why thou callest me good? There is none good except one, that is Almighty God. And if thou want to enter eternal life, you follow the commandments. He didn't say that if you want to go to Jannah, want to go to paradise, you believe that I died for your sins. He never said that. He said, follow the commandments. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 17 to 20, that think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I have come not to destroy, but to fulfill. Unless the heaven and the earth pass away, not one jot or tittle shall be passed away from the law until all be fulfilled. And whosoever shall keep the commandments, and teach men to do so shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And whosoever shall break one of the least commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the skies and the Pharisees, in no way shall you enter into paradise. Because if you want to be a good Christian, you have to follow all the commandments. There's only one God, you should not do idol worship, all what Moses, peace be upon him, said. So here we analyze, if we do a research of the biblical scriptures, it is actually believing in one God, not Trinity. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 171, Wala taqulu salasa. Don't say Trinity. In khairul lakum. This I stop, it's better for you. So if you say God is three in one, it is shirk. You won't get salvation. There's no statement at all about Trinity. The word Trinity does not exist anywhere in the Bible. But it's there in the Quran. Besides Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse 171, it's also there in Surah Maida chapter number 5 verse number 73. It says, لَقَدْ قَفْرَ الَّذِينَ قَالُوا 
Inna Allahu salisu salasa. They are doing kuf. They are blaspheming. Those who say that God is three in one. The word Trinity doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. The closest statement is the first epistle of John, chapter number five, verse number seven, which says, for there are three that bear a call in heaven, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And this verse of the Bible, by Thaidu scholars of the highest time, Christian scholars, in the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, they've thrown this verse out of the Bible as an interpolation, as a fabrication, as a concoction. So the verse which comes closest to the Trinity, doesn't mention Trinity, but comes closest, is thrown out by the scholars of Christianity as a fabrication. So if we analyze, if you want to check what is right in the Bible, here is the Furqan. This is the criteria. It will tell you what is right, what is wrong. And if you compare with this, and even today if you read the Bible, the Bible never claims that Jesus is God, peace be upon him. It says you should worship only one God. And when Jesus Christ, peace be upon us, asked that which is the first of the commandments, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12, verse number 29, he says, Shama Israelo Adnail Hainu Adnail Khad. It's a Hebrew quotation which means, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God is one Lord. So the problem is that if you read the Bible, the exact purpose of creation is not mentioned. It is vague. The Christian church has taken up a teaching of Paul, St. Paul, and says that you believe Jesus Christ, peace be and died for your sins, and you will go to heaven. Then you do anything, you rob, you rape, you do anything. If he's paid for our sins, if Jesus Christ, peace be upon paid for our sins, I can do anything. For example, someone tells me to a restaurant, go to the restaurant, eat what you want, I've paid your bill, I can eat anything. Chicken, mutton, biryani, anything I can eat. So if Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, I died for my sins, then you can commit any sin and you go to heaven, only you have to believe that he died for your sins. So this is the concept of the church, which is not what the Bible mentions. And you can refer to my video cassette, similarities between Islam and Christianity, which gives the similarities. That's the reason I say that Jesus Christ taught nothing but Islam that is submitting a will to Almighty God. Can we have the next question from brother over here? Please state your name and profession as well. Retired Supernant, at the outset, I am extremely delighted to be here, even though I am not a Muslim. In the Old Testament of the Bible, it is noted as that God created the day and night in the first day. After that, God created the sun and the moon. How is it possible for the day and night without the sun? Likewise, in Quran, it is mentioned that the sun rotates the earth. As per chapter 21, verse 22 of Quran, God controls the universe. My doubt is as to whether God had mistaken when he creates the universe. I think the contents in the Bible and the Quran are against the signs. Please explain. Brother, can I have your name? And can you repeat what is about the Quran? I didn't hear correctly. Your name first. And what do you mention about the Quran? Quran says that the sun Quran rotates. Quran in Surah number 6, I think. Quran number 6, the sun rotates. You said 21, 22. Chapter Quran, 21, verse 22. Cha chapter number 21, verse 22. 22. That the sun rotates. No. In Surah number 6, I think. Huh? But in chapter 21, verse 22, God controls the universe. Huh. So that goes against science, according to Yes. Brother asked a question. He said that he has read the Bible. He quoted a few verses of the Bible and of the Quran, didn't give the reference. He said that the Bible says that Almighty God created day and the night in the first day. What he's quoting is the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, chapter number one, verse number three. It says that Almighty God created the day and the night and on the first day. And further, if you read in Genesis chapter number one, verse number 13 to 19, it says, Almighty God created the sun on the fourth day. I'm giving you the references also. So doesn't this go against science? I do agree with you, it goes against science. And I had a debate with Dr. William Campbell in USA. Dr. William Campbell, he is a missionary and a medical doctor, and got a PhD in writing a book against the Quran. And in that debate on the Quran and the Bible in the light of science, even I posed this question, even he couldn't answer. So I do agree there's a problem in the Bible. Now coming to your question, that the Quran says that Almighty God controls the universe. Regarding the Bible, yes, I do agree with you, Bible is against established science. Regarding a question that Quran says Almighty God controls the universe, you didn't say that sun rotates. Ah, that, that's what I heard. Therefore, I'm asking you to repeat. Why are you repeating? 
I heard that. And he gave reference, chapter 21, verse 22, the reference is wrong. The no, real I, reference is... Sorry. I'll tell you, I'll tell you. Wait, wait, wait. The real reference is Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse 33, not 22. Verse 33. Here's the Quran. I'm speaking from memory. I'm not a computer. I'll give the reply, brother. After I reply, whatever query you have, no problem, brother. You ask, brother, you ask the question, let me reply. After I finish my reply, you can ask another 20 questions. But you ask the question, I was listening to you carefully. Now you listen to my answer. And after I finish my answer, if you have any query you can ask, I will give you enough time. If chairman doesn't agree, I'll request him to give you time because you are delighted to come here. We are more delighted that you are here. The brother said that the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse 22, it's actually verse 33, that the sun rotates. What he's quoting in the verse of the Quran of Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse 33, he says, Huwa lazi khalaqal layl wa nahara. It is Allah who has created night and the day. Wa shams wa kamar, sun and the moon. Kullun fi falaki as bahoon, each one traveling in an orbit with its own motion. And this mistake was even taken out by Taslima Nasreen. You know Taslima Nasreen? Heard of her? Ah, from Bangladesh. She said that if a book believe that the sun rotates around the earth, then how can we advance? So the Quran has to be changed. Nauz billah. The problem is that a view should be changed and she should read the Quran correctly. The Quran says, nahara. It is Allah who has created the night and the day. Washams of al-Kamar, the sun and the moon. Kullun fi as bahoon, each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. Nowhere does the Quran say that the sun rotates or revolves around the earth. Nowhere. What does the Quran say? The sun and the moon rotate and revolve. Nowhere does it say around the earth. The word earth is not there in this verse. It says, Huwa lazi khalaqal layl wa nahara. It is Allah who has created night and day. Wa shamsa wal kamar. The sun and the moon. Kullun fi falaki yas bawun. Each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. When I was in school, I had learned that the sun was stationary. It did not rotate about its own axis. It revolved in the universe. The whole solar system is revolving. But I, when I passed my school in 1982, I had learned the sun was stationary, did not rotate. But this verse of the Quran says, the Arabic word yasbuhun is derived from the word sabaha, which describes the motion of a moving body. If I use this Arabic word sabaha for a person on the floor, it will not mean he's rolling, it will mean he's walking or running. If I use this Arabic word for a person in the water, it will not mean he's floating, it will mean he's swimming. When Allah uses this word for a celestial body, it doesn't mean it's flying, it means it is rotating about its own axis. So Quran says the sun and the moon, besides revolving, they are also rotating about their own axis. When I read the verse of the Quran, I said, but I read in my school book, the sun does not rotate. Today, science has advanced, and we come to know we can have the image of the sun on a tabletop. And we see that the sun has got black spots. And these black spots take about 25 days to complete one rotation, indicating the sun takes approximately 25 days to complete one rotation. So what I learned in school in 1982, today science says it is wrong. Quran has mentioned this not 20 years back, 1400 years back. What I learned in school 20 years back. The Quran says, what I learned is wrong. First I got a shock. But then when I did more research, I realized that the Quran is right. Quran is not wrong. My science book was wrong. And Taslima Nasreen, where did she put the word earth inside? I don't know. Does she know Arabic? Can she read English? English translation doesn't say that. She assumed that when the Quran says the sun revolves, it revolves around the earth. That's assumption. So her assumption is wrong. Alhamdulillah, Quran is not wrong. And I do agree with you that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he controls this universe. That's the reason, according to Francis Bacon, Francis Bacon is a great philosopher, he said, little knowledge of science makes you an atheist, but in-depth knowledge of science makes you a believer in one God. Hope that answers the question. Do you have well, another question, If you question, have any brother. question, you're most welcome. If you have if you any have counter a question, you're most welcome, brother. We love you. Sir, I'm not sure the chapter number. No problem. I, I never criticized you. I just corrected I, you. But Did I, I tell? I have to just tell the right thing. If you have given something wrong reference, but, if someone opened that, corrected you. I didn't say that you have to know by heart. Neither are you a computer, neither am I a computer. But I think it is in the surah number 8. I think the sun is rotating earth. It's nowhere in the Quran. I'm telling you, the verse you're quoting is Surah Ambiya, chapter 21, verse 33, even quoted by Tasnima Nasreen and hundreds of critics of Islam. Nowhere in Surah Anfal, chapter 8, does it say that the sun, nowhere in the Quran it says the sun rotates. The closest misunderstanding you can have, if you don't know Arabic or don't read the translation correctly, is Surah Ambiya. So your first reference was very close, only 11 verses difference. So your reference was right, chapter number was right, 21. 
But the verse was not 22, it was verse 33. Yes, the Quran. No. Chapter number 21, verse 22. The God controls the universe. Aisha, now one more. The God controls the universe. That's from telling you. Science hasn't advanced so far to come to know about the reality of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've given the talk, is the Quran God's word, and I've proved scientifically the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I would request one of the volunteers to present my video cassette to him. I would request Brother Ashraf that you can ask one of the volunteers. I'll give you a gift, a video cassette, is the Quran God's word, which has mentioned several scientific facts and has even proved scientifically the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, today scientists, top scientists are not eliminating God. They are not the eliminating models of God. La ilaha. They are not eliminating God, but eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. You understand? So today scientists, top scientists in the world, they all believe in God. Most, some may have deviated, but most of them agree there has to be a creator about the creation of the universe. Today science tells us, how did the universe come into creation? How? By the Big Bang, correct? Yes. Yes, very good. Big Bang. That Today scientists they tell us that first there was a primary nebula, the whole universe, then there was Secondly, separation, a big bang, which gave rise to galaxies, which gave rise to stars, the planets, the sun, the moon, and the earth we live in. This is called the big bang. When did you come to know about this big bang? 20 years back, 30 years back, 40 years back, correct? Allah says in the Quran in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, Allah says 1400 years ago, Allah says that do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth were joined together. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. So Allah says that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. This big bang was today the scientists talk about is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years back in a nutshell. Who could have mentioned this? That time science wasn't advanced. Who? The creator. So like that I've given a full talk. You can refer to my video cassette of Quran Modern Science and this is the Quran God's word. Inshallah, inshallah, if you watch it with an open mind, you have to be convinced that there's one God and he is the creator of the universe. Thank you. Can we have the next question from the mic at the back? My name is Ravi and I am an IIT teacher. You said love. My love is that if I love God from the Lord, then these are the honesty and other good things that you have told in your life. I mean, you should be in a good person, you should be in a good person, you should be in a good person. Those are the good things that you have come to us. Then what is this? جو اللہ نے قرآن میں بتائے ہیں آپ کے کیا یہ نیم جروری ہیں اگر میں بھگوان سے صرف پریم کرتا ہوں تو کیا یہ کافی نہیں ہے ہمارے لیے اپنے اللہ کے طرف پرتی اپنا گریٹ فلنس یا پریز پرکٹ کرنے کے لیے The brother posed the question in Hindi I'll give the translation in English He said that God loves even he loves God, human beings love God. The moment you love God, all these good qualities I mentioned about honesty, about charity come automatically. So is it required that we should follow the commandments mentioned in the Quran? Is it a requirement? Brother, if everything comes automatically, you will automatically follow what is mentioned in the Quran. But everything doesn't come automatically to everyone. You understand? So what Allah wants, if you love your creator, for example, I say that I love my mother. I love my mother. My mother tells me that, my son, don't tell lies. No, I love you, mother. But what is the harm in lying? My mother says, get for me a glass of water. Mother, I love you very much. But I don't get the glass of water. I am sick, please get some tablets. Mother, I love you very much. If I don't obey the commandments of my mother, what is the use of this love? It is useless. It is a lip service. <laughs> Therefore, Allah says in the Quran in Surah an kabut chapter 29, verse number 2, just by saying you believe, Allah will test you. If you say you love, my Allah will love kar Allah will not leave you, Allah will test you. So just by saying you love Allah, or just by saying I believe in Allah, or believe in God, Allah will surely test you. So this life is a test. Now when you go for the test, if you don't know the rules and regulation of the test, there'll be a problem. For example, if you sit for an examination, first you try and find out what is the portion of the examination, and then you study that portion. So what Allah has said, certain things are inborn. I agree with you. Certain things, qualities, 
honesty, charity, it comes inborn. Allah has put. But many things we don't know. Not having alcohol is not inborn. Certain things that charity is inborn. May come, like if anyone is, suppose, anyone is tortured, you feel hurt. Certain things are inborn. Not to gamble is not inborn. So certain things are inborn, certain things are not. So what we have to do, we have to follow the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As Allah says, this life is a test. So unless you do not read the commandment of Almighty God, how will you pass the test? Why do I say read the Quran? Because this is the only book which is the revelation of Almighty God, which has remained in pristine purity. According to Sir William Moore, who is a staunch critic of Islam, he was forced to write. Forced means he was compelled, he had no option. That there's no book on the earth which has remained as pure as the Quran for the past 12 centuries. He said this 200 years back. Even a critic, he had no option. He couldn't lie here, he had to say. So compared to all the other scriptures of Almighty God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he sent several revelations. By name, you know four. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. Torah is the wahi, the revelation was given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the wahi, the revelation was given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the wahi, the revelation given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Quran is the last and final revelation which was given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Otherwise, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rawd, chapter 13, verse 38, we have sent a revelation every age. There were many more revelations sent. By the passage of time, they have got corrupted. The only one which has remained in pristine purity is the Quran. That's why I say that if you want to follow the real command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, follow this. And if you being a Hindu, if you ask me, how do I prove it? You have to come for my talk on the 18th of January on Sunday for similarities between Hinduism and Islam. Can we have the next question from the brother's side? As Dr. Saki gave the explanation just now, it's totally agreeable and I accept it. Because I'm not a Christian and I'm a person who thinks God is, should be there. As a cell phone is here, there must be someone created it. Otherwise, it's not existence in this world. Similarly, I believe in God, but I don't have a religion. And as Dr. Saki said, any other religion or worshipping other than Muslim is a sin. But how will you convince this little man over here that this only religion is only Islam and nothing else? But maybe the people, other religion things, or maybe you people are doing the sin. Because you are telling, we are sinning. And you know, these things keeps on happening between religion and religion. The brother asked a good question. He gave a Christian name, if I heard it correctly, but said he's not a Christian. He says he believes in God. If there's a cell phone, it has a creator, so that way he believes in God. Very good, alhamdulillah, congratulations. But he says that, how can you prove to me that I should only follow Islam? That's a very good question. Brother, Islam is an Arabic word, you may not know the meaning. So forget Arabic, leave it aside. What you should follow is, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 19, in the deen in the lail islam the only religion acceptable in the sight of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it is islam which is peace acquired by submitting your will to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if you believe in god that he is there you don't believe in religion what is the definition of religion religion means believing in god so if you believe in god and say don't believe in religion you're contradicting by definition of Oxford Dictionary, religion means believing in a supernatural being or God that deserves obedience. So if you believe there is God, you also have to obey him, right or wrong? And that's a different thing. You may not know which book is God's book. You understand? So if you believe in God, do you want to obey this creator or not? Yes or no? Yeah, but first Finish. you have to be convincing, right? That's right. I agree with you. I'm not telling you, but you have to obey the creator. Now, what the Creator has said, you have to find out. Correct? So now the brother agrees that there's a Creator, he believes in God, and he agrees that he should obey that Creator. The so same thing God is telling. The only way of life acceptable is submitting your will to God. That's it. Now, what is submitting? That's a different question. Correct? Forget the word Muslim. Forget the word Islam. Muslim means one who submits his will to Almighty God. If you submit your will to God, in Arabic, you call Muslim. Just by telling your name is Zakir or Abdullah or Sultan, you don't become Muslim. 
If I say my name is Zakir, I don't become a Muslim. If someone says his name is Muhammad, I doesn't become a Muslim. Muslim by definition means a person who acquires peace, one who submits his will to Almighty God. Now you want to know that how will you say that this is the right will of God, correct? For that, you have to refer to my video cassette, Is the Quran God's Word? Which is proof scientifically that this is the word of God which you and I believe in. You and I believe in, this is the same word of God. For that, refer to my video cassette. It is approximately four hours. I don't intend giving a lecture and a question for four hours here. And tomorrow you can come for my talk, Sharia. Sharia means the law of Allah, law of Islam. Barbaric or perfect? If you hear that talk, it will partly convince you. For complete answer, refer to my video cassette, is the Quran God's word. And inshallah, inshallah, you'll be convinced that this is the only way which is right. Names, don't go on Arabic names. Don't look at people, what people do, don't follow them. Don't judge Islam by what the followers are doing. If you want to judge how good a car is, if a driver does not know how to drive the car and he bangs up the car, who will you blame, the driver or the car? Driver. So don't judge Islam by looking at the Muslims. Judge Islam by the authentic source of the Quran. And if you judge according to this, if you want to judge the car, you'll go at the catalog, what is the speed of that Mercedes car, what is the safety measures, what is the average, etc., etc. Or you judge by putting a driver behind the seat who's an expert driver. So if you want to observe a human being, to know Islam is, the best example is the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The next question from brother here. Yes. I'm Prasanna. now. I'm doing my MBBS. Sir, you said that it was wrong to kill animals other than necessity, that is for target practice, etc. So in the present day, a man can live very comfortable and healthy life by being a vegetarian. So do you think it's wrong to kill animal for just for the sake of satisfying our taste buds? Brother Prasanna has asked a very good question, very relevant question to the topic. When I said that you should not kill any animals, they are creational life, unless you want for food, you cannot target practice. So why do the Muslims kill? animals, you can lead a healthy life according to him, being an MBBA student. So why only kill the animals for taste? Brother, point number one. A Muslim can be a very good Muslim even by being a pure vegetarian. There's no verse in the Quran or Hadith which says you should compulsory fard have non-veg or have flesh. You can be a very good Muslim by being a pure vegetarian. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number five, verse number one. You can have all the animals which are lawful for you, all four-footed animals which are lawful for you, with the exception named. Allah says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 5, that Almighty God has created animals for you so that you can eat the meat. Allah says in Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 21, that verily in the cattle is a sign for you. From among the body, you get a milk for you to drink. And from it, you derive warmth. And of the meat, you can eat. So when our Creator Almighty God gives us permission to have these meat, why should we not have it? Now coming to your argument that in this meat, you being an MBBS student, even I'm a medical doctor, I've passed my MBBS. And you being an MBBS student, you might have read, I don't know which year you're in first year, so you might have read that, that there are certain amino acids which are not synthesized in the body, which are known as essential amino acids. There are eight amino acids. Now these essential amino acids have to be given in the external diet. If you don't take in the external diet, it can cause loss to your body. No vegetable on the face of the earth gives you all the eight essential amino acids. No vegetable. The only food which gives you all the eight essential amino acids is the meat, fish, the flesh foods. Flesh food is rich in protein, rich in vitamins, rich in iron. It is healthy. But yet I do know that if you want, you can remain healthy even by abstaining from non-veg food. You can. By having a proper diet and checking up and etc. You can. I'm not saying you cannot remain healthy. But when the food is healthy, why are you abstaining from it? The reason people give is that you're hurting animals, which will come to it later. Now, if you analyze the set of teeth of the herbivorous animals, the cow, the goat, the sheep, they have flat set of teeth. They only have vegetables. They will never touch flesh, never. If you analyze the set of teeth of the carnivorous animals, tiger, leopard, lion, they have canine set of teeth. They have pointed teeth. They only have flesh. They never touch grass. 
If you analyze the human being's teeth, if you go and look in the mirror, if I go and look in the mirror, we find that Almighty God has given us flat teeth as well as pointed teeth. If Almighty God, if Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did he give us the canine teeth? Now, you are a medical student. The canine teeth is for flesh food. So this proves that Almighty God gave us for having non-veg food. Furthermore, the digestive system of the herbivorous animals, cow, goat, sheep, they cannot digest flesh. They can only digest vegetables. The digestive system of the carnivorous animals, tiger, leopard, lion, can only digest flesh. They cannot digest vegetables. But the digestive system of the human being, you being a medical student, know we can digest non-veg also and veg also. Vegetables also, flesh food also. Even flesh food. If Almighty God wanted us to have only vegetables, why did he give us the digestive system that can digest both? But natural to have it. Now coming to your question, that there is a misconception amongst the Hindus that the Hindu scripture does not permit them to have non-veg. I quoted the Quran. If you read the Hindu scriptures, brother, if you read Manusmiti, chapter number 5, Manusmiti, chapter number 5, verse number 30, 31, it says that if you eat the flesh of the animals which are meant to be eaten, you're not doing a sin because Almighty God has created some animal to eat and some to be eaten. Manu Smithi, chapter number 5, verse 31, that if you sacrifice the animal, the sacrificial animal, you're not doing a sin. Manu Smithi, chapter number 5, verse number 39 to 40 says that Almighty God has created certain animals to be sacrificed. So if you kill the animal to be sacrificed, you're not killing. Manu Smithi, chapter number 5, verse number 41, 42 says that a Brahmin who has knowledge, who knowingly sacrifices an animal, even the animal goes to heaven and even the Brahmin goes to heaven. Furthermore, in Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 27, verse number 2, a person says that I'm going to go for war. When I come back, prepare for me a great bull. Furthermore, Rig Ved, book number 10, hymn number 28, verse number 4, it says that Indra, he says that prepare for me bulls to eat. Buffalo, bulls to eat. And if you read the Mahabharat, Anushasan Parv, chapter number 88, if you read that, this is also mentioned in Manusmiti, chapter number 3, verse number 266 and 277. Yudhishthar, he asked Bhishma, what should we give in the yagna, in the puja, in sacrifice, so that our ancestors will be satisfied? So Bhishma replies that if you give herbs and shrubs, vegetables, our ancestors will be satisfied for one month. If you give fish, they'll be satisfied for two months. If you give meat, they'll be satisfied for three months. If you give hair, rabbit, they'll be satisfied for four months. If you give goat meat, they'll be satisfied for five months. If you give bacon, for six months. If you give deer, for seven months. If you give birds, for eight months. And the menu continues. This is scripture of Hindus. It further says that if you give a buffalo for 11 months, and if you give cow for 12 months, and rhinoceros, inexhaustibly, so even according to Hindu scriptures, even according to Hindu scriptures, it gives you permission to have non-veg, including beef. I'm not saying this. All the references are there. You can check it up. It's absolutely correct. Now coming to the logical point of it, that why do the human beings have to harm the animals when we can live without eating non-veg? The reason people give that killing an animal is a great sin and killing a plant is a lesson because plants don't have life. This was the logic. Previously, Hindu sages and sons, they had non which they had beef also, but they were influenced by the Jains of the Ahimsa philosophy who believed that plants have got no life, therefore eating a plant is a lesser sin as compared to eating an animal. But today, you know and even I know that plants have got life. So now the logic has changed. They say, okay, brother Zakir, we agree plants have got life, but plant can't feel pain. Therefore, killing a plant is a lesser sin than killing an animal. Today, science has further advanced and you have come to know that even the plants can feel pain. The plants have a nervous system. They can feel pain. They can even cry. They can even feel happy. They even feel sad. But the cry of the plant cannot be heard by the human beings because the human beings can only hear between a frequency of 20 cycles per second to 20,000 cycles per second. Anything below and above they can't hear. You may be aware of a silent dog whistle. The dog can hear up to 40,000 cycles per second. So the whistle has a frequency above the human frequency more than 20,000 cycles per second, but below 40,000 cycles per second. The master blows the whistle, human being can't hear, the dog hears and comes. So even the plants cry, but we can't hear. Just because we can't hear, that doesn't mean that we can torture them, if you say it's torturing. 
There was one person who argued with me and told me, that, but Zakir, I agree with you, plants have got life, plants can feel pain, but the plants have got only two or three senses. Animals have got five senses. Therefore, killing a plant is a lesser sin as compared to killing an animal. I told him, okay, brother, for sake of argument, I agree with you. Plants have got two or three senses, animals have got five senses. But suppose you have a brother, he's born deaf and dumb, two senses less. Can't speak, can't hear. When he grows up, somebody comes and kills him. So will you go and tell the judge, oh, me, Lord, give the murderer less punishment because my brother had two senses less? You, you will tell him, give him a bigger punishment. He was a masoom, you are sinless. How did he kill my brother? So Islamic logic doesn't work like that, two senses less or two senses more. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 168, eat of the good things we have provided you. What is good you can have? What is not good you cannot have. If you analyze that if you don't kill these cattle, life cycle of the cattle is very short. They reproduce very fast. If you don't kill the cattle for food, you'll have a problem of overpopulation of the cattle. The cow and the goat, they reproduce very fast. And if an Indian does not want to have non-veg, I've got no problem. If you don't want to have non-veg, brother, no problem at all. Personally, I'm happy. Because if all the Indians and the Hindus start having non-veg, then the price of meat will go high. Can we have the next question from the sister's side? I see there is... Uh, I cannot offend my Muslim sisters anymore. Uh, we can give you a chance. Yes, sister, you can ask the question. Assalamu alaikum. The question is not really related to your topic, but one of the sisters here would like you to elaborate on this. We feel that by sending our children to secular schools, they are losing their Islamic values. However, there are many other sisters who feel it's fine to send them to secular schools as long as they are taught Islam at home. Please comment. The sister has posed the question. I do agree it's out of the topic. And the chairperson gave her a chance, so I have to answer. She said that, is it right if we send our children to secular schools and teach Islam at home? Sister, secular by definition means nothing to do with God. If you send your children to secular schools, secular school nothing to do with God, but I know what you meant. What you meant for non-Islamic schools, run by Christian missionaries and others, secular school by definition means nothing to do with God. So if you send to a school with nothing to do with God, those are atheists, there'll be a problem. They will teach there's no God, you'll teach at home, there is God, there'll be conflict. The child will have a problem. Similarly, if you send to other schools which teach wrong things, who teach to worship other besides God. So there they worship Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, every day in the morning, and you come and say that worshiping Jesus Christ is shirk. So the child will get confused. You know what we are doing? It is we who are creating problems in the children. We are to blame. It is the duty of the parents to give an atmosphere which is the right atmosphere. It is like you're tying your children, tying the hands and the leg, putting them in the swimming pool and say, swim. How will you swim? So sister, my advice is, we do require the worldly knowledge, it's important. The first guidance of our Creator Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran to humankind in Surah Iqra, chapter 96, verse number one, is Iqra, is to read, is to educate. Our beloved Prophet said, it is obligated on every Muslim man or woman to acquire knowledge. So knowledge is a must, both knowledge religious as well as the other worldly knowledge, both is important, sister. But be careful while running after the other worldly knowledge, religious knowledge should not go behind, both should be there. So best is put your children in schools which do not conflict with the commandment of the Creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the best is schools which teach both. Imagine you go to school and they are taught about Darwin's theory, we have been created from monkeys, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we have been created from Adam and Eve. Now the child gets confused. How many confusions will you remove? The best is Islamic schools, unfortunately, unfortunately, there are very few Islamic schools, but Alhamdulillah, Summa Alhamdulillah, now, throughout the world, including India, there are many Islamic schools springing up. Some of good quality, some medium quality, some lower quality. What we should do, that we should support those people who are opening such schools. And Alhamdulillah, even our Islamic Research Foundation, IRF Educational Trust, has started a school three years back in Bombay by the name of Islamic International School. And we are striving so that we can give to our children what we didn't get. What we lacked in our childhood. We have a school we have started, inshallah, besides having the formal education. I don't call it secular. Mathematics is not secular. Science is not secular. I call it formal education because science is the Islamic subject, according to me. 
Mathematics is Islamic subject. The great mathematicians are Muslims. The great scientists are Muslims. So I don't call science as a secular subject. I call it for the non-Muslim formal education. Islamically, it's an Islamic subject, but should be taught in the correct perspective. Scientific facts, not hypotheses and theories like Darwin's theories, etc. So sister, it is important that we give our children the right atmosphere and see to it that they get the right education, that's the best. If you try and say that they go to a school which teaches wrong things and then come home and teach the right things about the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the religion, sister, you are playing with fire. I would advise you to put in an Islamic school. Hope that answers the question. The next question from the brother's side at the back. May peace and mercy of God be upon you all. My name is Saravana Kumar. See, Quran says God exists everywhere. And others also saying God exists everywhere and within everything. And somebody says, within ourselves also God is there. And if God exists in everything means, why don't we worship in an ideal? There is also a God, no. Then, if not, where God exists? Please explain. Thank you. The brother asked a very good question. Peace be on you too, brother. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace, mercy and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on you, brother. The brother asked a very good question that even the Quran it is mentioned that God exists everywhere. The Muslims believe God exists everywhere. Even the Hindus believe God exists everywhere. So what is the harm in worshipping an idol? God exists in the idol, God exists in human beings also. So what is the harm in worshipping an idol? Brother, nowhere in the Quran is it mentioned that God exists everywhere. Nowhere in the Quran is it mentioned God exists everywhere. I am aware there is a misconception amongst many Muslims who assume God exists everywhere. Nowhere does the Quran say they exist everywhere. What the Quran says, Allah's power exists everywhere. Allah has the power. The verse of the Quran, wherever you turn your face, you will see the verge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The face means the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is capable of controlling anything and everything. But the statement he exists everywhere is not mentioned anywhere in the Quran, neither in any hadith. I am aware that there are certain Muslims, a lot of misconception, they believe that. This is nowhere mentioned, but his power exists. Power exists everywhere. Now regarding a question, where does God exist? And why can't we worship an idol? Where does God exist? The Quran says, Allah is on the arsh. The hadith, where a lady approached and the Prophet asked her, where is God? She said, point on top. God said she has iman, she has faith. So God exists on the ash on the throne. The throne exists on the water. He's up in the heavens. So but naturally, he's not in the human being. Yes, he can control. Allah says, he's closer to you than your jugular vein. That means he is aware of everything. His power is there. That doesn't mean God himself has come into the jugular vein. That doesn't mean that. It means that Allah has power. He's close to you. That means he loves you. He knows you. He knows everything. He has power over everything. Not even a leaf can fall without the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now coming to your question, why can't we worship idols? If you read the Quran, Quran says in Surah Maidah chapter 5 verse number 90 which I quoted, idol worship is prohibited. Same thing, if you read the Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita says in chapter number 7 verse number 20, all those whose intelligence, you have to note down brother, Bhagavad Gita chapter number 7 verse number 20, all those whose intelligence has been stolen by material desires, they worship demigods. So materialistic people, they do idol worship. If you read the Chandogya Upanishad, chapter number six, section number two, verse number one, it says, ikkam evidityam. It's a Sanskrit quotation which means, God is only one without a second. It's mentioned in the Sveta Sitar Upanishad, chapter number six, verse number nine. Na cha se kasij janita na chadipa. Of him, there are no lords. He has got no parents. Almighty God has got no father, he has got no mother. Almighty God has got no superior, he has got no master. It's mentioned in the Shweta Sveta Upanishad. Chapter number four, verse number 19. Nata Sipatima Asti. Of him, there is no likeness. It's further repeated in the Ajurved, chapter number 32, verse number three. Nata Sipatima Asti. Of him, there are no images. Almighty God has got no images. So the moment you make an image of Almighty God, you're going against the Veda, you're going against Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Gita, Vedas, all these scriptures, they speak against idol worship. For the detail, you can come to my talk on, not tomorrow, next Sunday, 18th of January, on similarities between Hinduism and Islam, and I'll deal with this topic in detail. 
So even idol worship is prohibited in Hinduism. Why do they do? The Hindu scholars have a certain logic, which you can reply to that also. You come for my talk, similarities between Hindus and Islam, and inshallah, you'll get more knowledge on this aspect. Hope that answers the question. The same question was answered. If you have a counter question on that. Okay. I have a doubt on that. Sir, first of all, you have misunderstood my question. I'm not here to contradict Islam or nor am I advocate of Hinduism or anything. I'm just, my question is just based on your speech. You said it was wrong to kill animal for pleasure, right? So I just want to know that eating out of, suppose I'm thinking mutton is tasty, sort of my own personal pleasure, I'm killing animal. Is it wrong? I'm not trying to contradict you or put into a doubt. Just want to know your point of view, that's all. Brother, you're most welcome to ask any question. I don't feel hurt at all. I know you're not contradicting. Even if you contradict, no problem, brother. It's my job. I'm a dai. It's my profession. You can criticize me. You can criticize the Quran. I'm young, but I can take it, alhamdulillah. No problem, brother. I don't get agitated. You can ask any question. No problem, brother. The question he said that, when I said in my talk, that you cannot kill for pleasure of hunting, I said. For pleasure. Hunting. You cannot kill any animal just without any purpose. Or pleasure of hunting. Here, we don't eat non-veg only for taste. We eat for our sustenance. So if you say we can't eat animals, we can't eat plants also, what will we eat? How will we survive? How will we survive? So... Clarify you. I'm not asking if I'm eating it for necessity. Suppose I think, okay, this animal food is going to be tasty. I want to kill it for my personal pleasure alone. Not I'm feeling of hunger or nothing. Is it also a sin? If it's for eating, for eating tasty food also no problem. You have to eat. If you don't eat, you can't survive. If you don't eat, you can't survive. So Almighty God, as mentioned in Manusmiti, chapter number 5, verse number 30, some animals have been created to eat, some to be eaten. No, but I have read it. I'm just asking, you're asking you're your point of view. Is it wrong to my kill point a, of view? Is it wrong to kill an animal on the basis of just merely taste pleasure? It is not wrong at all to kill an animal even if you want to have tasty, as long as it is for food. Okay, thank Why? you. Why? Because Quran gives permission in Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 1. Manusmiti gives, you don't want to know, but I want to tell people that I believe in this part of Manusmiti. The other part I may not believe. But this part of Manusmiti I believe. Chapter 5, verse 30, that Almighty God created some animals to eat, some to be eaten. So if you eat the animals which have been created to be eaten, you're not doing a sin. But similarly, Quran also says certain animals have been created to be eaten. But if you eat the other animals which have not been created for eating, then it's a sin. So those cattle, like sheep, etc., which are permitted in the Quran, that if you eat, for food, even if it's tasty food, no problem. Some people want to have vegetable, tasty vegetable. Some people like brinjal. Some people like lady finger. So no problem. If I agree with you that nothing should be eaten, then you will have to kill either the plant or the animal. So while eating, if you're eating good things, as long as you're not wasting. If you waste food, it is wrong. If you waste food, it is wrong. So if you kill for eating, for sustenance, even if it's tasty, no problem, it's permitted. It's mentioned in the Quran, Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 1, Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 5, as well as Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse 21. Hope that answers the question. Can we have the next brother? Okay, brother. What's the question? One more question, sir. See, the world has shrunk only at the present age, a few decades back or a few centuries back. I don't think so. The preaching of Islam was throughout the world, right? You said it was wrong to associate any followers with God. It's the greatest sin. But a person brought up in some part of the world, Telling that, okay, this is Lord Shiva, Lord Vishnu, or Jesus, whatever. He's led into believing that, okay, that is only God. See, he, is he also committing a sin? A very good question, brother, asked. That the world is so big, and Islam just 14 years back, according to him. And people may not know about Islam. Somebody believes in Shiva as Lord, or Brahma as Lord. So what's the problem? Someone believes that Jesus Christ is God. What's wrong? I, being a student of comparative religion, besides Quran saying it is wrong, even the Hindu scripture says, and the Christian scriptures, regarding Jesus says God, I quoted. So if the Christian scripture says it is wrong, so why should the Christian worship? Tomorrow someone calls you God. Someone calls me God. What, I would agree? What we have to do, what is wrong is wrong. Regarding calling Brahma, calling Brahma as God, or Shiva as God, if you analyze these statements, I mentioned Rig Veda. Rig Veda? Book number two, hymn number one, verse number three. There are no less than 33 attributes given to Almighty God in Rig Ved, book two, hymn one alone. One of them is Brahma. Brahma is called creator. God. If you translate creator to Arabic, it means Khalik. 
we Muslims have got no objection if someone says Almighty God is Khalik or Creator or Brahma. But if someone says Brahma is Almighty God who has got four hands and on each head is a crown, we Muslims take strong objection to it. Moreover, you are going against Yajurved, chapter number 32, verse number 3, which says, Na tasya patima asti, of that God, there are no images. Same thing, Vishnu. Vishnu is called sustainer God. If you translate sustainer or cherisher into Arabic, Rab. We Muslims have got no objection if someone calls Almighty God as Rab or sustainer or cherisher of Vishnu. But if you say Vishnu is Almighty God who is traveling, on a couch of snakes, he has got four hands. One hand is a discus, left hand he has a conch. He's traveling on a bird of Garuda. We take strong objection to it. Moreover, you're going against Sveta Setara Upanishad, chapter number four, verse number 19, which says, Nata Sepati Masti, of him there are no images. So brother, if certain people follow wrong things, if they follow Brahma as the creator who has got no images, the almighty, without associating partners, there's no problem. Regarding a question that people may not know Islam, Islam, brother, as I said in my talk, is not a new religion which came into existence 14 years back. It is there since time immemorial. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, also taught Islam. He said, not my will, Gospel of John, chapter 5, verse 30, not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, not my will, but the will of Almighty God, is a Muslim. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a Muslim. He taught nothing but submitting a will to God, which if you translate into Arabic means Islam. Adam, peace be upon him, taught nothing but submitting a will to Almighty God. Noah taught nothing but submitting a will to Almighty God. Moses taught nothing but submitting a will to Almighty God. Jesus taught nothing but submitting a will to Almighty God. May peace be upon them all. If you translate to Arabic, it is Islam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last and final messenger. He was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Anbiya, chapter number 21, verse number 107, Wama illa rahmatul alameen that we have sent thee not but as a mercy to the whole of humanity, as a mercy to the whole of mankind, as a mercy to all the creatures, as a mercy to all the worlds. Therefore, it is the duty of every Muslim. I ended my talk by saying the quotation of the Quran of Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 110, which says, it is the duty of every Muslim to convey the message of Islam to the others. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Fusilat, chapter number 41, verse number 53, Allah says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim hatta yatabayyana anna ulhaq. That soon we shall show them our signs in the furthest regions of the horizons and into their souls until it is clear to them that this is the truth. There may be some people living in some far off island which no one may have heard about Islam according to you. Allah says, He will put the message of the Creator in everyone's heart by the signs in the horizons and into their soul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, he himself will give the message of submitting the will to God directly. So even if we don't do the job, yet he will get the message. And then if you reject it, you will be a loser. If you accept it, you have passed this test. Hope that answers the question. Can we have the next question from the sister's side? Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. If Allah knows that people will do sins when they are sent back again to earth, after removing the thoughts of hellfire, why did he not show the mankind that even to people of today's generation that these are his punishments, so that people seeing them by their own eyes fear Allah and go in the right path? Sister has a very good question. That if you see the real thing in the next life, in the hereafter, see the hellfire, everyone will believe that we should have believed we made a mistake. But Allah cannot send them back and wash their memory because they will again commit the same sin. So why doesn't Allah show them here? That's a very good question. Sister, Allah does give trials over here also. Allah has mentioned in the Quran about the hellfire. But what say, are kon hell mein jayenga? Fire hai kya nahi hai? We think that where is Jannah? Where is, we see that afterward. So we don't believe in it. Allah has told, but we don't believe in it. Regarding trials, Allah gives you trailer, you know, highlights here. For example, AIDS. Allah says in the Quran, He has punished many of the people, many qom, many nations previously, and He extinct completely qom and luth and various qoms. Even today, you know, AIDS, AIDS came in the 80s, early 80s. It's a punishment. Punishment from Allah. Acquired immune deficiency syndrome, AIDS. That's a punishment. First homosexuals got it, then heterosexuals got it, do outside their marriage. So here we find Allah gives us signs. All these are signs. For example, Bosnia. It's a calamity. The people of Bosnia, two ways. Some people did wrong. People are Muslims. How are they? Were they practicing? Most of them weren't practicing Muslims. They didn't know Islam. So Allah gives signs. There may be good people also in Bosnia. 
So Allah says, when he gives this punishment, even those who don't do sin may get punished. For them it's a test. The calamity, when Allah sends the calamity, even those people who are not sinful, Allah says in the Quran, even the calamity may befall them. But that's for them a test. So here, all these are tests, sister. What's happening in the world today? Bosnia, what's happening? You see the other part, what's happening in Iraq? All these are tests, but where do we human beings reflect? We say, it's happening in Bosnia, it's happening in India, it's happening in India. It's happening in Gujarat, it's happening in Madras. So all these are signs, sister. Allah is giving you tailors. And if you read this book, the last and final guidance, and we realize it, then we realize he is the creator, he alone should be worshipped, and we always say, Alhamdulillah, whatever he has given us. Hope that answers the question. Can we have the next question from Deepak? We have time for a couple of questions more. The last two questions. Yes, brother. Assalamu alaikum, sir. This is perhaps my first meeting uh, with Dr. Zakir Naik, and uh, I'm very convinced by his speech. Can we have your name and your profession, Murtuza. please? Murtuza is my name and I'm doing my MBA. So I had a small question, sir. You have told me that uh, Allah, Allah Park knows that what each of us are going to do, what each of us are going to do next, why this world has been created and where we lead to, what am I going to do the next moment? Also, it's been decided. Okay? So is this word test justified? Because uh, the very fact, whenever we use the word test, logically speaking, it is perhaps an event where the consequences are not known. So in wherever we use the word test, that this world is a test. So are we justifying? Because if we already know, if Allah Park knows what is the consequences going to be, where each of us are heading to, and what each of us are going to be. So why, why are we here? And... Uh, I understood your question, brother. So one second. question at a time, please. No, I just want to complete this thing, sir. You complete the question. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Already given and a short if speech. you are the scientist, and if you have an experiment, and if you know what is the consequence is going to be, so why the experiment, and why do you want to do it? The brother has asked a question. Inshallah, if the non-Muslim should come up first on the microphone, we prefer non-Muslim asking the question. Volunteers should see to it that non-Muslims should be brought front. If any non-Muslims, you're most welcome. You can walk through. You can break the queue. Come in front. It will be preferable. Brother Murtaz asked a question that when a test takes place, the consequence is not known. If the consequence is known, where is the test? If a scientist does the experiment, he doesn't know the result. If he knows the result, then what's the test? Very good. No one is testing Allah. Allah knows the consequences, but Allah is not undergoing the test. We are undergoing the test. And you and I don't know the consequence. I don't know my consequence. I don't know I'm going to go to Jannah. If I had known I was going to go to Jannah, I wouldn't have come all the way to Madras. I travel throughout the world. I sweat it out. I don't know. My Jannah is not secured. If my Jannah was secured, then why would I left my medical profession and flogged out here and this? I don't know. I'm not sure I'm going to go to Jannah. I'm asking for the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Be merciful, put me in Jannah. I pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I cannot say, oh, I'm a great die, I'll go to Jannah. The consequences is not known to the person who undergoes the test. You do not know whether you go to hell or heaven, I don't know. But Allah knows. And you may have missed out the point in my lecture that when the teacher takes the examination, many a time the teacher knows the consequences. Teacher knows this student is going to come out first. Teacher knows he's going to fail. So do you mean to say, I will not sit for the examination? The test is yours. The test is not for the teacher. And when the scientist does the experiment, the scientist doesn't know the result. Therefore, he does the experiment. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a scientist. Allah is not experimenting on us. There's a mistake. Allah is not experimenting on us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the creator, the best to create. He is given, made a creation, the human beings, who has the free will. He knows. But the reason he's letting us go in this world, because if he does not let you undergo this test, on the day of judgment, you will ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, why did you put me in hell? If Allah puts you in hell, Allah alam, I don't know. So you'll object. So because of that, I said in my lecture, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just. So Allah is not undergoing the test. Allah doesn't require us. Allah is already the greatest. We are undergoing the test and we don't know the results. Because we don't know the results, that's the reason we are striving. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may he grant us mercy, may he forgive us, and may he put us in Jannah. Amen. And we have the next question from the brother here. I am Saktivel, doing B.Tech in MIT. Sir, you are told that God told I can forgive any sin other than accepting a partner to me. To Islam only, they are praying Allah. Other than that, for Hindus, that and all, we are not following Allah, that and all. So, 
we are sinners in your point of view. The brother asked the question that Allah says he may forgive anything if he wants. Not that he will forgive. That doesn't mean that if you believe in Allah, you can do any sin. If he wants, he can forgive you. But the sin of shirk, he'll never forgive. Regarding other non-Muslims or worshipping anyone besides Allah. Allah means the true one God. You may call him by any name. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 110, Pulidullah Abidur Rahman. I am Atadufal al Asma Husna. So call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful names. But the concept should be correct. He should not be begotten, he should be one. If you worship the true almighty God, whichever name you call, but it should be a good name. Correct concept, no problem. But if you worship thieves, if you associate partners, like if someone says Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, is God, we consider him to be a messenger of God. If you call him God, then not only a sinner, it is the biggest sin. According to the Quran, not according to me, according to the Quran, Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 48, Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 116. Not only according to the Quran, even according to the Bible. Even according to the Bible, Almighty God says in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 5, verse number 7 to 9, Thou shalt not make image of Almighty God, it's a sin. Even according to Rig Veda, it's a sin. According to Yajur Veda, chapter 32, verse number 3, it's a sin. So not only Quran says it's a sin, even the Hindu scripture says it's a sin. Suppose a Muslim says, I believe in Allah, and he starts worshipping Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Nauz Billah. Suppose a lunatic. He says, I believe in Allah, but he worships Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and says, even he will not go to Jannah. Same way, if a Christian worship, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Though the Bible says he should not be worshipped, your Vedas says he should not be worshipped. So according to your Vedas, you will be a sinner. According to Bhagavad Gita, you will be a sinner. According to the Upanishads, you will be a sinner. According to the Quran, you will be a sinner. According to the Bible, you will be a sinner. Hope that answers the question. About creator and creation. Sir, I want to know... Your name, what, please. Muhammad Isaq. Any non-Muslims in the ladies' side, this? Okay, brother, you can continue with your question. Human beings, mostly Muslims, are punished. Taken from Bosnia to Kashmir in Iraq. Mr. Zakir told me that even in the world, they are punished. Sir, is there anything that for one sin in the world also punished? and in the Akhirat then also will be punished? Well, there was a question that Muslims are being punished everywhere. In Bosnia, we are being punished. In other parts of the world, we are punished here also and punished in Akhirat also. If a Muslim is a true Muslim, true Muslim means, what is the meaning of Muslim? Not Zakir, Sultan, Abdullah. Muslim means one who submits civil to Almighty God. For a true Muslim, these calamities are a test. It's not a punishment. And the maximum calamities came on the prophets. In the Akhirat, they will get Jannah. But if you are a namesake Muslim who say your name is Abdullah, Zakir, and Muhammad, etc., but namesake Muslim, but don't follow commandments, you can get punished here and even can get punished there. Because Allah says in the Quran in Surah Al Imran, chapter 3, verse 185, Kullu nafsin every soul shall have a taste of death, but the final recompense will be on the day of judgment. So you may get part punishment here, the balance is there. Part punishment. This is Bosnia. Small part punishment. Balance is there. So final is there. Or you may get a calamity. You may get test calamities here, but in Akhra you may get Jannah. So if you follow the commandments, you're on the true part. Whatever comes, you say Alhamdulillah. Hope that answers the question. Okay, brother, you can ask a question. We have a non Muslim brother. Yeah. Hello, I'm Vivek. Um, I'm a software engineer. And I have certain. Uh, today's lecture was very good. In uh, Quran, as far as I've read, in one chapter it says that uh, Allah says to Jesus that have you told to the people to worship yourself and your mother as part of Trinity? That means, that puts, that uh, Quran believes that Mary and uh, Jesus are part of Trinity. No Christians believe like that. The brother asked a very good question. The Quran says that Jesus Christ never told the people that you worship me and my mother as God. No Christian believes that Mother Mary is God. Brother, your knowledge of Christianity is limited. There are more than thousands of denominations in Christianity. Thousands. Thousands. Even I don't know all. And there's a denomination known as Mary Mike, who believe in the Trinity. One of the form of Trinity is Mother Mary. They believe Mother Mary to be God, though they are very few now. Now they exist or I don't know. But if you read the books of Christianity, it talks about a sect, a denomination, which believe that Mother Mary was God. Hope that answers the question. Uh, but I am a Christian. So, 
Um, but according to the whole Bible, I never have found out the place that where Jesus says that worship my mother or it is, it is like. Brother says he is a practicing Christian. He never found in the Bible where Jesus said that worship Mary, peace be upon him. Neither did Jesus say worship Jesus, peace be upon him. But yet you worship. <laughs> the Quran doesn't say what the Bible says. What Quran says, say to the people, some people worship. The so same way Bible says that never did the Bible say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said unequivocal statement. In the complete Bible, where Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, himself said that worship me, I am God. But yet the Christians worship. You don't worship, Alhamdulillah. I congratulate you. If you don't worship Jesus Christ as God, Alhamdulillah. Then you're coming closer to Islam. And Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said in the Gospel of John, chapter number 16, Verse number 11 to 12. I have got many things to say unto you, but he cannot bear them now. For he, when the spirit of truth shall come, he shall guide you unto all truth. He shall not speak of himself. All that here shall he speak. He shall glorify me. Talking about another messenger to come. Talking about the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So you believe in the Bible. You also have to believe in the last messenger mentioned in the Bible. That is Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Hope that answers the question. The next question from here, brother. Good evening, sir. My question is, why should God create us why should he keep the test? Why should he send us to uh, hell or heaven? Brother, that was the question. Why should God create us? Why should he send here? The whole talk was on that. Why sh That's what I told you. The whole talk was based on that. That why should God create us? To test us, etc. Now someone appears for an examination. MBBS examination. No, the, yes, that's what I told you. Brother, the whole talk was based on that. And if you... Yes. Why should he create us? Huh. What is the need for him? Okay, fine. Why should he create us as human beings? Okay, that's a very good question. That why should he create us as human beings? I'll give a different angle to it. Because if we analyze what Allah says in the Quran, that when Allah asks that who would like to be sent as a human being, the mountains and all, they said no. But the human beings were fools who said no, we want to become human beings. Because the other creation, they don't have a free will of their own. Like angels, no free will, okay, they are good. But if you become a human being, you have a free will. If you have a free will and then if you obey Allah, then you become higher than the angels. If you have a free will and don't obey, then you become, then you fail. So we human beings were fool, including me, myself. We said, ah, we want to get distinction, high marks. So Quran says, we human beings were fool, who said we want to undergo the test and now we are tested. You won't come to know now. On the day of judgment, Allah will give you that memory. So Allah says in the Quran, and Allah testified in Surah Araf. Chapter number 7, verse number 172. He brought the children of Adam from the loins, and Allah says, and testified, do you agree there's one God? He said, yes, we agree. Now the memory has washed out. On the day of judgment, again it will come back to you. So we were the fools who said we want to undergo the test. Now somebody wants to sit for an MBBS examination. The teacher said, sit. If you have got admission in the medical college, no problem. Now you sit. If he fails, that's his problem. If he pass, that's his problem. You understand? And the test is different. What question has to be given? That is the choice of the teacher. You can't tell, oh, teacher, why have you given me this question? That is the prerogative of the teacher. Whether he wants to give you question number one, question number two, whether he wants to give you a question from chapter number three or chapter number five. Therefore, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives different questions to different people in this test. Some people he makes rich, some people he makes poor, some people healthy, some people are disease. Different people he tests different way, but depending upon the way he tests them, the correction is like that. If the test is difficult, the teacher corrects the paper leniently. If the paper is easy, the teacher corrects the paper very strictly. Same way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, depending upon the facility he gives the different human being, he tells them accordingly and he is the most just. Hope that answers the question. We'll take one. Do you have a question, brother? All right. We'll take one last question from you and we'll conclude the program then. This is uh, regarding the lecture. Uh, you told in one place that uh, angels do not have free will. But somewhere in Quran, I read in Al Bahra, I read that uh, Iblis was not willing to bow down to Adam when Allah told. So that is his free will. He took it like that. MashaAllah. Our brother Vivek is very learned. He read the Quran, MashaAllah. Our brother Vivek has read the Quran. And I do agree with him, Surah Bakhra. He's quoting the verse of the Quran from Surah Baqarah, chapter number two, verse number 34. He says, we told to the angels, bow down, all bow down except Iblis. This is mentioned not only in Surah Baqarah, it is mentioned minimum seven times in the Quran. In Surah Araf, chapter number seven, Surah Hijar, chapter number 15, Surah Kahar, chapter number 18, same thing. We told to the angels, bow down, all bow down except Iblis. So now Iblis objected. So from this we come to know 
that Iblis, if we read the translation, we understand Iblis for the angel. We think. But if you read in Surah Kahaf, chapter number 18, verse number 50, it says that we asked to the angels bow down, all bow down except Iblis. Iblis was amongst the jinn. You understand? So Iblis was the jinn. So now you tell me, brother Zakir, seventh place is Allah said to the angels, bow down, all bow down except Iblis, means angel. Now one place in the Quran says he was a jinn. So there's a contradiction. Correct? It's a contradiction because this is the translation. In Arabic language, there is a law called as law of Taglib. Taglib means if the majority is addressed, the minority need not be addressed. For example, if there are 99 doctors and one engineer, and if I say all doctors stand up, even that engineer will stand up. Because in the law of Taglib, in Arabic grammar, the majority is addressed, minority is I need not say all doctors and one engineer stand up. But in English language, if I say all doctors stand up, only doctors will stand up, that one engineer will not stand. So nowhere does the Quran say that Iblis was an angel, nowhere. We, because of the translation and lack of Arabic knowledge, we think, we assume. Many of the Muslims also assume. But the Quran clarifies in Surah Kahaf, chapter 18, verse number 50, that Iblis was a jinn. And jinn, like the human beings, have a free will. So, amongst the angels, there was one jinn also present, who was Iblis, he was very pious. But his arrogance, that why should I bow down to Adam? He's made from mud. I'm made from fire. Arrogance. That made him disobey Almighty God. He was a jinn. Even human beings and jinn, both have a free will. They can disobey God. So here they disobey God. And that's the reason he was taken out. And he is the biggest Satan. And now he tries to attract the people who are on the path of God and tries to distract them from the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I hope that answers the question. We have to... No. I know, but we have to close. Okay. Okay, go ahead fast. I am Muhammad Khaja Modi, retired officer, Madras University. Assalamu alaikum, Haji Dr. Zakir Nair Sahib. Sir, you have told that you have opened Islamic International School in Mumbai. I request you, why not you open Islamic School in Chennai and other parts of the places? Because this is a need of the day today, sir. Thank you, sir. Whether you give me the land and give me the funds, inshallah, I'll open it. Thank you very much, brothers and sisters. Shukran, Jazakallah Khair.